uh, what uh, Nasser has asked me to cover today uh, is a big topic which is the indication and interpretation of urea, creatinine and electrolytes. When uh, last week uh, I received this that I need to cover all of this urea, creatinine, potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium in one hour, I thought of uh, going to K2. Uh, this is the uh, second highest peak in the world. It may be easier to go on top of K2 and come back down than to cover all these topics um, in one hour. Uh, so, but uh, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to provide you the overview of uh, what's going on. I think we're getting some echo from up there. Is this all right uh, with all of you? It's bothering me though. Teach uh, our residents about the electrolytes, and uh, I've been assigned this task uh, in one hour. So let's hope uh, that uh, both of us get something out of this uh, one hour period of time. So, first, we are going to talk about urea and creatinine. And the format of this talk is going to be basically answering these three questions when to do it, and, or why to do it and what to do once you get the result of that test and how to interpret that uh, result. So the clinical settings in which usually you do the urea and creatinine are when someone has a known chronic kidney disease. This is pretty obvious. Someone has, is known to have a kidney disease and you're going to follow up on that, whether it's worsening, whether it's staying the same. In diabetics, especially type 2 diabetics at the time of diagnosis, because as all of you know, they have been diabetic for a long period of time before they are diagnosed, and by that time, the kidneys may already been affected. So you want to do it at the time of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, and then yearly thereafter if they are normal to begin with. In type 1 diabetics, since their date of onset of diabetes is pretty obvious because they develop diabetic ketoacidosis, they get into trouble pretty quickly and you know that they are diabetic right away, you don't necessarily need to do it for 5 years because this is the time frame it takes for the kidneys to get affected. And at that point you may want to check the kidney function, but in type 2 at least at the time of diagnosis. People who have been hypertensive for a while, at the time of diagnosis and then if the uh, blood pressure has been difficult to control, you want to do it periodically, maybe every year or so, you want to check their kidney function. And I'll tell you why uh, when I, we go along with that. Other clinical settings in which you want to check the urea and creatinine, patients who have severe gastroenteritis, not the simple old gastroenteritis, they are coming in with a little bit of diarrhea, a little bit of vomiting and you are thinking of infectious etiology, you gave the antibiotic oral hydration at home, you don't need to check on that. But the people who you are thinking of giving the IV fluid or you are going to be giving some drips to them, you may want to think of doing the, electrolyte, uh, the kidney function and the electrolyte check on those uh, people. Congestive heart failure, liver disease, people because they are prone to developing renal failure because of their underlying disease. So it's a good idea to monitor urea and creatinine in these patients. Patients who give the history of kidney stones, their creatinine needs to be monitored because as you know, kidney stones are pretty common and they lead to permanent kidney damage and requirement for dialysis. So if we can detect it early, we can act on that. A patient who comes to you with edema, lower extremity edema, and it's not obvious from your physical exam, so one of the things you're going to do is check the kidney function and you need to check the urea and creatinine. If someone has symptoms suggestive of multi-system disorder, like someone is having joint pain, they have rash, they have hair loss, you may be thinking about SLE. And in those patients, you want to check their urea and creatinine because renal involvement happens in about 50% of the patients with SLE, and that is usually one of the things for which they die. They may not die of the joint pain or rash or hair loss, but if they develop the kidney failure, they can have a permanent damage from that. So in those patients, you want to check urea and creatinine. Patients who have been using multiple analgesics for a while, they come to you with joint pain, you take a history, they tell you for 10 years they've been taking dichloran, brufen, all those kind of things. They may be developing analgesic nephropathy in which you may want to avoid non-steroidal for them in future and may want to give them some uh, uh, narcotic analgesics, but you want to check their urea creatinine at that point. 
patients who have been using lot of alternative medicine especially the akeem medicine they use heavy metals in those in kushtas and in all those and heavy metals can cause gomelonephritis if they've been using akeem medicine and they come to you with vague symptoms which are not uh, you can't translate into a single system and they're having tiredness, fatigue, their appetite is down, they have used the Hakeem medicine, it may be a manifestation of their kidney failure. So in that point you want to think about doing the urea and creatinine. We always advocate that patients uh, who have diabetes or who have heart failure, they are started on ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. But one of the things to do is once you start that, it's a very good medicine and we should be using it very frequently, but small proportion of the patients cannot tolerate the ACE inhibitor and ARB. And in those settings, the thing is you start it and about a week or 10 days later, you want to check their creatinine and their potassium. Because if they have renal artery stenosis or they have small vessel renovascular disease, their creatinine will go up. And if they go up, that's a sign that you need to stop the ACE inhibitor. If it doesn't go up, it's a very good medicine and all of us should be using, especially in our diabetic population who is hypertensive, patients with heart failure, you want to use ACE inhibitor and ARB, but you want to monitor the response with that. So these are some of the scenarios in which you want to check the urea and creatinine. This is just uh, the outline of the kidney. It's a complex thing, how the urine is formed and how the urea and creatinine come out of this. And we're just gonna briefly review what happened. The other thing before we go to that is why we want to measure the kidney function. One is in those clinical settings, we wanna know what's going on. We want to know what extent the renal impairment is, and I'll show you some of the graphs that if the creatinine goes up, how you can say what the GFR is. You want to see how quickly the kidney function is going down. And that is, you look at the creatinine at a serial level, and then you will know the speed at which it's going down and whether your intervention is being effective. And as the kidney function is down, you need to make adjustment in the drug dosing, especially the antibiotic which you're using. Or if you're giving someone digoxin, you need to adjust it for the degree of renal dysfunction. So these are the things why we need to know the uh, GFR. Usually for kidney function measurement, there are lots of parameters. But usually we use urea and creatinine, but in uh, other countries, people also use a lot of other methods to exactly measure what the GFR is. But we are going to focus on commonly used parameters, which are the urea and creatinine. So how is urea formed? Urea is formed by the hepatic metabolism of amino acids that are not utilized for the protein synthesis. And when they go through this process, they make urea or urea nitrogen. We commonly employ it in clinical practice, but remember, it's a very poor marker of GFR. Just looking at urea doesn't tell you what the kidney function is because it's affected by lots of other things. And what are lots of other things? Its production is not constant. If you have given someone tetracycline, urea is going to be high, but their creatinine will be normal. It's because the protein breakdown is happening. The muscles start breaking down. So when the protein breaks down, it's gonna make urea. So that doesn't mean that the kidney function is bad. That means that the production has gone up. The same thing is with steroids. Patients who have GI bleed, in blood, how much protein is there? Anyone wanna guess? You have you do the total protein and it's usually albumin is four protein the globulin is three and a half so you say seven to eight grams of protein but remember hemoglobin is also a protein and that's about 12 grams 13 grams your normal hemoglobin is 12 to 14 11 to 13 whatever your lab use so it's about 20 grams of protein in every 100 cc of blood so if someone had a gi bleed they basically and they lost a unit so if they lost 300 cc of blood, that's like eating 60 grams of pure protein. And that protein is gonna go into the circulation and gonna make urea. So urea is gonna go up, but the creatinine will be normal. And that's why we say urea alone is not enough to say that the kidneys are bad. And usually when I get the patients who are just the urea elevated, I start looking for some other reason rather than the kidney function. Sometimes it's deceiving to look at the urea because where is urea formed? In the liver. 
if someone has a chronic liver disease, they are not going to produce that much urea. So you're going to see a normal urea, but the creatinine is slightly raised, and you may think that the kidney function is normal, whereas that person may have bad liver disease. Or someone who is not eating much, their urea is going to be lower. So for all practical purposes, the take-home message is that urea alone is not enough to say that someone has kidney disease. Okay? It's a poor marker of chronic kidney disease. On the other hand, the creatinine may be a little better marker of kidney disease, but it has its own flaws, which we need to know uh, when we are interpreting those. Creatine is derived from the metabolism of creatine. It's a spelling error. In skeletal muscles, we have creatine. When it's metabolized, it makes creatinine. And the little bit of dietary meat intake gives us creatinine too. It's freely filtered across the glomerulus, and it's not reabsorbed or metabolized. So whatever is filtered comes out. So we take a look at the creatinine. If its production is constant and it's coming out constantly, blood level will be constant. And we say that's why it's a marker of kidney function. Okay. So in steady state, in when the excretion is the same as the production, your GFR, which is the function of basically your kidney function, glomerular filtration rate, multiplied by your plasma creatinine will be equal to your creatinine excretion and everything is in steady state. So when you look at the plasma creatinine, indirectly you are looking at the GFR, how good the kidney is functioning, that is what you know. Okay? If plasma creatinine goes up, your GFR is down because the product is constant. If your creatinine is 1, your GFR is 100, your product is 100. 100 multiplied by 1 is 100. If your creatinine is 2, to make it 100, your GFR is 50. 50 multiplied by 2 is going to be 100. So if your creatinine is gone up to 2, that means your GFR, your kidney function is down to 50%. So that's how we interpret it. We look at the creatinine, we say normal creatinine is 1, it's gone to 2. So the GFR is gone down to 50% or 50. When it goes from 2 to 4, that means to make it the same 100 because your GFR is going to be, total is 100 because the constant is going to be 100. So your GFR is going to be 25 because 25 multiplied by 4 is going to be 100. So when your creatinine is 8, your GFR is 12.5 because 12.5 multiplied by 8 is 100. So looking at the creatinine, you can tell how much is the kidney function. So normally when we look at the creatinine, we say it's just two, it's not that bad. But actually that's when the majority of the damage has happened because it has gone from one to two and the GFR is down 50%. And then incrementally it's keep on going up. So as your creatinine is up, your GFR is down. So the rule of thumb to remember is you have a constant of 100 and wherever your creatinine is, you can check what the GFR is going to be. So 100 divided by whatever creatinine is, you're going to get your thing. That's a guess, uh, average what it comes out to be. So this is what we were talking about. Rise in plasma creatinine reflects reduction in glomerular filtration rate. And this is the relationship. It's not projecting very well that once you have a normal GF creatinine, which is like one, on this column is the plasma creatinine, your GFR is like 100, 120. Then when it goes to two, it is half, it's 60. When it is gone to eight, it's gone down to about 12 and a half. The same thing which we are talking about. So the relationship is like curvilinear with the creatinine for the kidney function. This again, unfortunately, didn't project that well with the light. But the females tend to have lower creatinine than the males. Anyone can think of a reason. It's because females have less muscle mass. If you have a less muscle mass, you're going to produce less, so your creatinine normal will be lower. So if a male has a normal creatinine of 1 or 1.2, females it's 0.8. So by the time they go from 0.8 to 1.5, their kidney function is half, as compared to males going from 1 to Two. But this is what we are talking about, the normal people, normal males and normal females. How is it going to be affected? But before we do that, there is another formula in which you have the plasma creatinine and you say, okay, Nabil is six feet tall, he has a little more muscles than someone in the audience, or the other person is even bigger than me, so the creatinine production is different. How would I know that the GFR is going to be the same because Nabil is producing more creatinine than someone else? So it should be different. So there is a formula for that. This stands for creatinine clearance. 
you can take creatinine clearance as a marker of GFR or GFR. What you do is 140 minus the age, because as we grow younger and younger, when we become 70, 80, we have reduction in our GFR naturally. And our muscle mass also goes down, for which we use the lean body weight. So we take that patient's body weight, we know the age, and we have done the plasma creatinine level. So you put in this formula, so say for example, and to give you an example, say for example someone is 70 years old. You say 140 minus the age 70, it's about 70. Their body weight is say for example 80 kilos. Creatinine is 1, here is 72. So if you do the math, it's going to come out to be close to 70 ml of GFR. Although their creatinine looks 1, that's an age related reduction in the kidney function. So in elderly people like an 80 year old person who has a creatinine of 1, you may say, okay, this is a normal kidney function, but it's not entirely normal. For him, this may be a GFR of 60 cc's in there. So we have to be careful when we're giving elderly people the doses, and that's why all of you are aware in elderly people, you give a smaller dose as compared to the younger people. Part of the reason is because their kidneys are naturally with age losing some of their function. And that's why you tend to say, uh, elderly hai, hum zara dose thodi si kam humne di hai. So this is the rationale because many of the kidneys, uh, many of the drugs goes through the kidneys. There are some other caveats in there. Sometime if you start producing a lot of creatinine, your serum creatinine may go up but the kidney function norm may not be bad. In that case, if I give you a big McDonald's Big Mac, double Big Mac, and I draw a creatinine before you eat the Big Mac, and I draw a creatinine an hour or two after you eat the Big Mac, is there going to be a difference? And the answer is yes. There's going to be a difference because you took all this meat, some of this is going to make the creatinine and it's going to come out in the urine. So sometimes you order the creatinine and your patient comes back and their creatinine normally runs 1.5 or so. You say, okay, he has a stable high blood pressure induced renal dysfunction. The next time they come in and it's 1.8, you say, oh, oh, this thing is worsening. I better do something. But this may uh, do something may very well be that the patient had the creatinine done after eating a big meal. So their kidney function may not have changed. So you want to do it at a constant time that if your patient is going to have a blood work done in the morning and you are following it, they may want to do it in the morning. Or if you see this little bit of rise, ask them, did you have a big meal before you had this done, before you start panicking that the creatinine is worsening because this can cause the thing. If someone is having rhabdomyolysis, the muscles have where the creatinine comes, when they are breaking apart, creatinine production is going to go up. Then there are certain drugs which uh, all of us use, which artificially increase the creatinine, but that doesn't mean GFR is affected. And one of that is the septron we use. That will cause the increase in the plasma level of creatinine without affecting the GFR and cimetidine. Both of those will cause. Then sometimes your lab has the interference with the assay, especially if they're using flucytosine or some of the uh, cephalosporins or acetoacetate production in diabetics. So you may have artificial increase when the patient's GFR not be uh, uh, deranged. So to summarize, most of the time creatinine is going to give you the information about the kidney function. But sometimes there may be these special situation in which your creatinine may be a limiting factor and you have to keep that in the back of your mind. But the thing to remember is that when the creatinine is up going from 1 to 2, your kidney function is half. Going from 2 to 4, it goes down another half. And then going from 4 to 8, it goes down another half. That's why you normally see when people start dialysis, their creatinine is in the range of 8 to 10 range. And that's because the kidney function by that time is 10%. Okay, and when the kidney function is 10%, that's when they start having uremic symptoms and they're going to need dialysis. And that's why we don't necessarily do 24-hour urine on those people to measure the kidney function. We, just by looking at the creatinine, tell what the kidney function is. Okay, so the next last thing is, when do you think you can make a significant role in 
taking care of the epidemic of this chronic kidney disease. If you detect the patients early with the chronic kidney problem and you have appropriate workup done on these patients, you can slow down further damage to the kidney. The recommendation by National Kidney Foundation are that if male has a creatine greater than 2 mg per deciliter and female greater than 1.5 mg per deciliter, you want to have one time visit with the nephrologist to get the opinion, is there anything else we should be doing? It's not that you don't know what to do, it's because you are taking care of 10 different problems of that patient. And when they come to the nephrologist, he has a tunnel vision and he's looking at the kidneys. So he can give you the suggestion, these are the steps you may want to add to what you are doing to prevent further damage to the kidney. And these are usually the cutoffs where you can play a vital role in early diagnosis and treatment of chronic kidney disease. So that's how we measure the uh, uh, urea and creatine, and these are the limitations. Everyone tired by now? No? Okay, let's do the potassium. The next is uh, when are you going to do the potassium or the sodium uh, level done? So potassium we're going to talk about. So when are we going to do it? We are going to do it when someone has severe gastroenteritis and you are planning to give them IV fluids. And you are planning to give them the infusions, you want to know what their potassium status is and how much you are going to be replacing. All of you know that when the patient is having a lot of leg cramps, weak net, tiredness, you want to check their electrolytes, especially the potassium, magnesium and calcium in those people. Someone who has very severe hypertension, not ordinary hypertensive every time, someone you are giving three, four different medications and their blood pressure is still elevated and you know that your patient is compliant, they are taking the medicine, they swear that they are taking the medication and the blood pressure is still uncontrolled, then you want to check their potassium because if they have a low potassium, that may be a clue that they have adrenal problem. They have hyperaldosteronism and their aldosterone is so high and they have a secondary hypertension so you get a clue on that that okay the potassium is low uh, my patient may have secondary hypertension and I need to look for that you're not going to look for every patient who, to, to have secondary hypertension because 98 percent of the people are going to have essential hypertension but in resistant cases who are getting three or four medication you want to check their potassium Obviously, patients who have known kidney disease, you're going to be checking their potassium because they are, have the tendency to become hyperkalemic. This is very important. People who are on diuretics. If you're giving the diuretics, you want to check their potassium both ways. You may be giving a diuretic by which they will excrete the potassium. You may be giving a potassium sparing diuretics, especially in diabetic, if you are giving them, say, for example, aldactone. They already have a tendency to have a high potassium. Aldactone will make it even higher and make them prone to having arrhythmias and die from that. Patients who are started on ACE or ARB, we talked about that. So when you do 10 days later a blood test, do potassium and creatinine. They don't need anything else after starting the ACE inhibitor. Ten, 7 to 10 days later, you want to just check one potassium and one creatinine. And if they are staying stable, then you don't need to worry about that for next six months. Patient taking proarrhythmic drugs, like someone's taking digoxin, digoxin toxicity will increase if the potassium is disturbed. So you want to check in those patients. Okay. So these were some of the indications, the examples of when you are going to do it. So once you have done the potassium level and it came out abnormal, how are we going to deal with that and what is going to be our thinking, which direction we need to go. Briefly, to uh, refresh your memory for the physiology we have read in our medical college, our total body stores are 3,500 molecular, and most of it is inside the cells. And outside the cell, the level is 3.5 to 5, and it's a major determinant of resting membrane potential necessary for neuromuscular function as well as cardiac function. So whenever we look at the potassium homeostasis, either the potassium is high or low, how the balance is being affected, and I think of that as an external balance and internal balance. External balance is how much is the intake and how much we are getting rid every day from the body. And the two routes we get rid of the potassium from the body are our kidneys and our GI tract. 
in our stool and in our uh, through our urine and a little bit also from the sweating especially in the summer uh, weather so that's how we get rid of that so if we have a GI problem if we have a renal problem our potassium is going to be disturbed with that since most of the potassium is inside the cells if there is anything which is making potassium go into the cell or is making it come out of the cell is going to make them hyperkalemic okay so the cause is the way to remember is how much is the intake how much we are getting rid in the kidney through the GI tract and the balance inside and outside the cells so what are the things which affect the internal balance this balance this is a little bit tricky business so I'm gonna go over that uh, uh, before we talk about this balance so the things which will affect which are probably important from your standpoint are the insulin someone who has diabetic ketoacidosis they come in with a very high sugar or they come in even they don't have DK but their sugar is 600 pure osmolality high osmolality will suck the potassium from the cells outside so their potassium may be high someone who comes in with asthma attack with an MI in your office their potassium is going to be low because whenever there is lot of adrenaline it push the potassium into the cells okay and then is our causes of low potassium which is less than 3.5 are inadequate intake like someone is consuming alcohol alcohol doesn't have much of a potassium starvation people who have anorexia increase extra renal losses like in diarrhea people using laxatives renal wasting with diuretics and this is what we were talking about people who have severe hypertension then they can have secondary causes of uh, hypertension and low potassium may be the clue for that so once we found a low potassium this is the flow diagram how we should proceed with that first of all we want to rule out that this is not a problem in which the potassium itself is normal but while the lab was doing it it came out to be abnormal and that can happen if someone has like leukemia and their white cell count is like 100,000 then while the blood is sitting in the vial those white cells will eat up that potassium and the potassium when it's checked it will come out to be low that doesn't mean patient has a low potassium that means these white cell has eaten up everything so once you see a low potassium if you know your patient has leukemia or something then you want to think about that rather than just giving them a lot of potassium to eat then you think of this is this the problem with the external balance or is it the internal balance in the internal balance three things I would like you to remember are the asthma attack in patients who are having a myocardial infarction heart attack or if someone is withdrawing from the alcohol in all these three conditions there is lot of adrenaline lot of sympathetic drive which is going to push potassium into the cells and the external will be if the intake is decreased or someone is taking the diuretics or someone is having the diarrhea and in those patients you want to give the potassium replacement so before we give the replacement why do we really care about low potassium and these are the reason why we care it causes arrhythmias it has ECG changes it can cause ileus it can cause rhabdo in children it can cause growth failure these patients can develop in itself because of low potassium kidney problem and they cannot concentrate the urine so they may have a lot of urine output so this is how the ECG will look in patients who have hypokalemia this is your normal ECG and this is how the ECG is going to look if they have low and in this one you see concentrate over here here you have the T waves but here the T wave is flattening and you are developing a new wave in there that new wave is what's called U wave okay so in patients who have hypokalemia and they may put it in your uh, exam when you have your MRC GP exam with hypokalemia they may put an ECG in there for you to look at and ask you is this ECG consistent with high potassium low potassium what is so uh, thing to remember is in hypokalemia you have U wave and I'll show you how things look in hyperkalemia and they become very easy to recognize so when you are treating this patient with hypokalemia you want to preferred route is oral so how much to give the potassium if normal potassium is 4 and someone's potassium is 3 
since most of the potassium is inside the cell, their deficiency is in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 milliequivalents. That's a lot of deficiency. When they're down to two, it could be 400 to 600. Rule of thumb over here is for every 0.1 increase in potassium, you usually need 10 milliequivalents. If the kidney function otherwise is normal, they have diuretics so or they had bad diarrhea and their potassium is low, for every 0.1 which you have to raise, you have to give 10 milliequivalents. Okay? And the syrup which you use usually is K-Lite syrup. K-Lite syrup, 15 cc's has 40 milliequivalents. So usually you give the potassium when the potassium is 3.4, 3.3 or 3, if you give them 15 ml, that's like giving them 40 milliequivalents, that should increase by 0.4. So if they are 3.4, they should go close to 3.8, and that will be a safe bet for you to give if you are using the syrup uh, in there. So usually you want to give orally, but say for example you are seeing the ECG changes, potassium is very low. Ideally this patient should be in the hospital, and they should get intravenous potassium replacement. And the way we do the intravenous potassium replacement is we mix 10 milliequivalents of potassium in about 100 cc bag of saline and we give it over one hour. If someone is in the ICU and have a central line, we can give up to 20 milliequivalents per hour. Why do we give little when we are giving IV, but when we are giving orally, we are saying 15 ml is not a big deal. It's a 40 milliequivalent you can give easily. The reason is, when you're giving intravenously, it has to, it's going in the blood quickly as compared to GI tract, and most of the potassium is inside the cell. So it's gonna need time to go into the cell. So if you give too much in the blood, the potassium concentration may go up very quickly and go in the reverse direction because it didn't get enough time to go into the cells. And you may end up with the problem of hyperkalemic changes. So intravenously you give slow, 10 milliequivalents, maximum 20 milliequivalents per hour, Orally, you can give 40 milliequivalents, uh, like 15 cc's every two to four hours, you can repeat the dose of that and monitor the potassium level. And obviously, you're gonna treat the underlying disorder. So that was low potassium. Say for example, you send the patient's potassium and now it came up as greater than five. What could be the causes for that one? Either they're using too much, and what kind of diet has a lot of potassium, which we tell our patients who have kidney disease or who are taking the ACE inhibitor not to use that diet. Those diets are usually the citrus fruit, like the oranges, uh, your uh, bananas, peaches, uh, your these uh, other melons has a lot of this. Uh, watermelon has actually less, so if your uh, patient asks you, uh, you're telling me not to take melon, how about the watermelon? They can take a little bit of watermelon. Potatoes, tomatoes, dry food has a lot of potassium. So these are the things you're gonna be telling your patients who are, whose potassium is high to avoid those, especially the bananas, uh, the oranges, melons, peaches, uh, mangoes have a lot of dried fruit, uh, tomatoes, potatoes. I have a whole list of that. If uh, some of you are interested, I can give you the sheets of that to give to your patients if uh, in the practice when you see them and uh, provide them information about the diet. Then we want to think, is there a renal problem, like they have renal failure or they are, have a kidney stone and that's blocking because that will produce high potassium. Look at the list of the drugs your patient is taking. If they are taking the ACE inhibitor like lisinopril or these kind of medication, their potassium may be high because of that. If they are using non-steroidal, that will make it. This trimethoprim in septron, in patients who have the tendency to develop hyperkalemia, this blocks the sodium channel in the collecting duct and can produce hyperkalemia. So the drug history is very important. You want to review your list of medication you are giving because that may be the culprit for hyperkalemia. These are the things we talked about, someone having insulin deficiency, someone having cell lysis because most of this is inside the cell. So if someone is having muscle pains and their potassium is high, you may start thinking about rhabdomyolysis. And one of the things which you probably see frequently, not that frequently, but the drug which you use frequently in your practice, which can cause rhabdomyolysis is your statins for the cholesterol. So if you're, you're giving the statins and they come in with muscle pain and uh, they are complaining of a little bit of cramps, so you order a potassium and it comes high, be suspicious that you may be dealing with a rhabdo and the drug you want to stop is your statin.
ठीक है बट लाइक द हाइपोकलेमिया नॉट ऑल हाई पोटेशियम आर रियल इफ यू सेंड दिस पैसमन टू द लैब एंड लैब डेंट डील इट वेल दिस पैसमन कैन हीमोलाइज and when they hemolyze and the blood cells break down potassium is going to come out of the cells and that's going to produce high potassium in the specimen not in the patient so once you see a high potassium don't panic check with your lab uh, and ask them was the specimen hemolyzed they can usually look at that they should be writing on the paper that the specimen was hemolyzed so you don't have to unnecessarily go through the aggravation of calling them and maybe the lab which you use you want to ask them that whenever i order a electrolyte if the specimen is hemolyzed please indicate on the report that the specimen is hemolyzed so you are not uh, unnecessarily worried about that if these cells are breaking down they can cause high potassium too just like leukemia cells are eating away but if those cells sitting over there are breaking apart they can give you high potassium also so what happens with high potassium there are ecg changes and lethal arrhythmias these patient can have muscle weakness they can go in respiratory arrest so what will be the ecg changes two changes you need to remember in that one t waves were getting low so if there is a hypokalemia low potassium t waves are low if there is a high potassium t waves are tall so okay that's how i remember that if the potassium is high t waves are high if potassium is low t waves are low so this is where your peak t waves are so if you do ecg in your uh, clinic and if you happen to have a ecg machine and you get a high potassium you do the ecg you see a patient with high or peak t waves you say okay this is a real problem of high potassium i need to deal with this if we don't deal with this this is what's going to happen the qrs complexes which are nice over here starts opening up so widening of qrs complexes tall peak t, t waves and then they can go into fibrillation and they can die from that okay so hyperkalemia is an emergency and how we do we deal with that the way to deal with the hyperkalemia is threefold you want to stabilize the heart membrane so they don't go into this arrhythmias then you want a second thing you want to do is you want to push this potassium into the cells and the third thing is ultimately you, the time you have bought by pushing it into the cells you want to get rid of the potassium from the body so three aspects of hyperkalemia management are stabilize the membrane push the potassium into the cells and then try to get rid of the potassium from the body so how we do that the way we do that is we stabilize the membrane with calcium gluconate so if you happen to keep calcium gluconate in your office and you see this uh, patient with hyperkalemia the one thing you want to give is you want to give one ampule of calcium gluconate to the patient you bought some time because the membrane is stabilized and you can transport the patient to the hospital if you have extensive setup in your clinic where you work and you have other things like insulin dextrose these things you can give them 10 units intravenously regular insulin 10 units intravenously not sub q intravenously 10 units of that and that will push the potassium into the cell but once we give someone insulin what we worry about they are going to become hypoglycemic so you want to give them some dextrose ampules so one or two ampules of 25% dextrose you want to give along with that so they have enough sugar so they don't become hypoglycemic so by this you are pushing the potassium into the cell the third thing is you want to get rid of this from the body and how can you get rid of from the body say for example they are not making any urine there is a available resin which is called k exalate k exalate powder what it does is you give mix it in the duflex syrup or lactulose syrup you give them to drink it does in the gut is the potassium it takes from the gut and the sodium it gives up so it binds to the potassium and then the patient have two three uh, stools and the potassium gets out of the body that's one way of getting out of the body if they are still making urine you can give them iv fluid like normal saline and give them some furosemide lasix by that the urine output will increase and potassium will get out of the body so we said there were two routes by which we get rid of it from the kidney from the gi tract we can utilize any or both of those to get rid of the potassium but say for example your patient says i'm not making any urine okay and i can't drink this stuff 
then unfortunately they are going to need dialysis to get rid of the potassium and then they need to be in the hospital. So once you see a patient with hyperkalemia, we do the ECG. On ECG, if they are peak T waves, then we give them an ampule of calcium. We give them 10 units of regular insulin, give them two ampules of dextrose 25%, and then think of getting rid of this extra potassium, whether by giving them the K-exalate or giving them the Lasix. And obviously, we're, you're going to stop the medication or something which is making it go high. So this is how we're going to treat hyperkalemia. If there are no ECG changes, then you say, okay, is it a lab problem or something? I better repeat the potassium without putting in a tonicate. Sometimes if you apply a very tight tonicate to draw the blood, the locally the potassium will come out of the tissue and you will get an erroneously high potassium. So you, if you have a high potassium, you did the ECG, that looks fine. What you do is you don't put in the tonicate, draw the blood and send again and see what the potassium is going to be. Okay, so this is government college. And the picture was very nice, but just to tell you, there was a lot of rain on that day when this picture was taken. So there was a flood in the ground over there, and you see the reflection of this thing. This is not art. It just turned out this way that there is a reflection uh, down there. OK, so this was potassium. One more thing which we're going to talk about, and then we're going to cruise through the calcium and magnesium quickly for the sake of time. But I have put in, in your lecture notes for you to review. But uh, we didn't have enough time, and I couldn't reach to the top of the K2 today. Uh, so we're going to be finishing up probably in the middle somewhere. So sodium concentration, when do we worry about those? When to do? Again, the theme is when someone has volume depletion, like they're having gastroenteritis, you're going to check sodium, potassium, creatinine, all those three together. Someone who is taking thiazide diuretics, because thiazide diuretics can make people hyponatremic as compared to Lasix or the loop diuretics. And there is a reason for that. If someone is interested, I can explain afterwards. So if someone is having gastroenteritis or is having thiazide diuretics or they are complaining of fatigue, tiredness, nausea, vomiting, they look you a little bit confused, disoriented, people with seizure, it could be a metabolic seizure because of uh, hypo uh, natremia or could be from uh, hypocalcemia so you're going to be checking those so in this one basically there is volume depletion and those patients are getting hyponatremic then the other condition which makes people balloon up with the fluid and those conditions are liver disease heart failure and kidney disease so the patients who have a lot of fluid on the body so people who are fluid depleted or overloaded you want to check their sodium concentration. So if the sodium is less than 135, we call it hyponatremia. If it's greater than 145, we call it hypernatremia. So once you have a low sodium, what are we going to do? The first thing we want to make sure is it's a true sodium. So anytime you get a lab result, the first thing you want to make sure is, is it true? Or is it a lab error or a physiologic change in the body which is giving you a false result. So but you have the plasma osmolality. If the osmolality, you know, normal is 275 to 295. So the true hyponatremia is in which your osmolality is low, less than 275. The other ones are called non-hypotonic and these are either can have normal osmolality or high osmolality. But the one which we worry about are hypotonic. These are the causes of isotonic and hypertonic. These are less common, but I listed it for your uh, reference sake. So this is the diagram you may want to keep in your mind. You have low serum osmolality. Your sodium is low. You want to do a good physical exam. And why we want to do the physical exam? We want to see if someone is volume depleted or they are volume overloaded. Or on exam, we think they are really normal volume. And the causes are divided on those three. So if someone is volume depleted, their heart rate is very fast, they are orthostatic, they stand up, they start feeling dizzy, they've been having nausea and vomiting, or they've been diuretic, they have volume depletion. So the cause is different. In this case, we are going to treat the patient with normal saline. If they are volume overloaded, we are going to give them Lasix. So treatment of low sodium really depends upon what you find on physical exam. On physical exam, if someone is volume depleted, you are going to give them saline. If they are volume overloaded, 
you are going to give them diuretics and restrict their volume. And if they are really uvolemic, then we have a condition called syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. That is probably uh, you're not going to be uh, doing it or uh, dealing with this very often in your uh, practice. But if you think that the patient is not volume depleted, they are not volume overloaded, but their sodium is low, that may be the time to get uh, some uh, suggestion and give a telephone call uh, to your colleagues in the nephrology that uh, my patient has normal volume status and it's low, what should we be looking at next? And those something which we should be looking at next is right here. This is the SIADH. You need to do all these testing to figure it out. And I just left it in here for your reference. So what kind of symptoms your patient have? Your patients may have headache. They may be feeling nauseous. They may be a bit confused, obtunded, rhabdo. They can go in respiratory arrest if the sodium is that low. So if it's between 125 to 135, it's not an emergency. You can figure it out what it is and treat it. But if it's less than 125, then it becomes an emergency and you may want to have your patient be in a uh, hospital setting where we can figure it out uh, by doing certain testing. So this we talked about, if there is volume depletion, you give them isotonic saline and correct the underlying cause. If they are volume overloaded, you fluid restrict them and give them loop diuretic. Okay. We're going to skip these. This is what we do if someone is very symptomatic, their sodium is less than 110 or they are confused and they are having seizure, we give them hypertonic saline 3%. It's not easily available and you have to make sure that you don't correct it too fast, otherwise they can have this condition of central pontine myelinolysis. And sometimes uh, this thing also comes uh, in the boards uh, in your exams that if you correct your low sodium very quickly, what will happen? And they will have this weird term in their central pontine myelinolysis. Now the question is if the sodium is too high, if the sodium is greater than 145, so what happens when our sodium is high? Our brain senses that our osmolality is very high, high sodium is there. And we get what Doxav is going to do, he's going to drink water because his osmolality right now is high. Okay, he probably had something to eat and now he has all that salt load. His sodium went up a little bit and his brain said, I need some water to bring the sodium down and your thirst is stimulated and we start drinking water. The other thing what happens is the kidney releases ADH. And when they release the ADH, your urine become very concentrated. You remember in Ramadan, when we are fasting, we are thirsty and our urine becomes very dark. It's concentrated because we are trying to retain all that water. The reason is our sodium is heading in this direction. So when it starts going above 140 or so, brain starts getting stimulus. Too much, too much, too much. And it sends the signal, drink water, drink water. And it sends the signal to the kidney, retain all the water. So your urine becomes very concentrated, dark color. You make a little bit of urine when you're fasting in there. And this is what's going physiologically. If this becomes too much, then you have a problem and we have to figure out what can cause that hypernatremia. And that could happen because of three reasons. You can lose pure water from the body and that happens when you have ADH deficiency and that condition is called diabetes inspidus. One was diabetes mellitus, which all of us deal very frequently. But if you have a patient who says, I pass a lot of urine, I pass a lot of urine, and I drink lots of water, and you check the sugar, you think he may be becoming diabetic because he's very thirsty, he's drinking a lot of water. You check the sugar, and sugar is normal. Then you say, what could it be? It could be the other kind of diabetes uh, which is going on, and they can't keep their urine concentrated and they are getting rid of all that water. Okay? That is called DI. Or if there is a lot of respiratory and dermal thing, like we have in uh, uh, summer, if we are standing outside, we are losing all that sweat and water, so we're going to become thirsty. In that case, you replace it with water, water replacement. Sometimes what happens is we are losing both sodium and water, but we lose more water than sodium, so the concentration goes up. And that happens in patients who have a lot of uh, sugar, so they are having osmotic diuresis. Because the sugar is high, they are 
passing a lot of urine and they become dehydrated and their sodium tends to go up. In that cases they need both salt and water but more water than salt and in that case you give like, them like half normal saline. Okay, that kind of solution. This is we see in the hospital setting only when someone comes with a cardiac arrest and we have given a lot of soda bicarb ampules, their sodium can go up in that cases. Or if someone of you use the salt tablet uh, for patients uh, whose blood pressure is low kind of a thing, they may develop hypernatremia because of that, excuse me. So the, these are the causes for hypernatremia. This is the treatment for that condition. I have put in the diabetes inspectors and the causes for that and the treatment for your reference uh, in the slide and that will be in your handouts. Okay. So how much time we have? I have seven minutes uh, left and in those seven minutes I'm going to cover the calcium uh, too real quick. Okay. Five minutes will be done in three minutes and 50 seconds. Okay. Trust me on that. Calcium homeostasis. So when are you going to do the calcium? When someone complains of numbness around the, their mouth, their hands are tingling, their feet are kind of tingling, or they say they suddenly develop this spasm and they develop something like that. You think of uh, hypocalcemia, that the calcium is abnormal. You can do certain tests in your uh, clinic setting, and this is again may come on your MRCGP exam chauvistic sign and true year sign. They are very simple. Chauvistic sign is because with low calcium, your nerves are very much excitable, easily excitable. So what you do is you push a tap in front of this tragus. Here the facial nerves divide into five. When you do that, it will make the facial nerve excitable. So the patient will have twitching like this. That will give you a clue that I'm dealing with hypocalcemia. They're having numbness in here. You do this, they are doing uh, this thing. The other thing is, that's chauvistic sign. The other one is true years. You put the blood pressure machine, you inflate it above the systolic and leave it and start chatting with them. They will be cursing at you. Why is it not putting the stethoscope or they'll get rid of it? But you give it a minute or so, okay? If by reducing the blood flow, if you, uh, there is less calcium to begin with, calcium level will go down and they will start having the spasm of the hand. So they'll say, oh, I have a cramp, I have a cramp, and their hand will look like this. Okay, that tells you it's a real hypocalcemia you are dealing with, and that's why they're having the numbness around that and all this. This is called true year sign. So if those two are positive, you think that this is a patient of hypocalcemia. The most common hypocalcemia probably you see in your clinic center uh, setting is a anxious young girl coming in there who has been hyperventilating with anxiety and they say, Mere jo na soye ja hai, aur mere jo na Those patients don't really need the calcium, they need a brown bag to breathe in that because they are hyperventilating and what happens with that is uh, uh, right here. With the pH going up because they are hyperventilating, their ionized calcium goes down and they start having these symptoms. The other condition in which you want to do is if someone has kidney problem because kidneys produce vitamin D, if the vitamin D is low, they are going to have hypocalcemia. Someone having rhabdo or muscle breakdown, low magnesium will cause low calcium. Someone has bad tummy pain radiating to the back and they have pancreatitis, their calcium will go down and thiazide diuretics will make calcium go up. So most of the calcium as you know is in the bones, a normal level are listed over here. Calcium in the body is in three different flavors. The only flavor which is important is this one which is ionized calcium. Part of it is bound to the protein, part of it is complex with other things. So these don't matter as far as the functioning. This is what matters. And that's where if you see a normal or an abnormal calcium, someone's calcium comes out to be seven. Seven is low, normal is 8.5. You say this patient is hypocalcemic. That may not be true because if that patient looks to you wasted, they're not eating much, their albumin is low, so their complex calcium may be low. So the correction is, and this is again which may be on your exam is, for every grams per deciliter decrease in albumin from normal, calcium goes down by 0.8. So if normal albumin is four, if someone is two, how much calcium extra is down? 
0.8 multiplied by 2 is 1.6. So if you have got 7 as a result and the patient's albumin is 2, their corrected calcium is 8.6. So that calcium is normal. The other way to come around that is you check the ionized calcium. You order a ionized calcium, then you don't have to worry KB albumin kitni and I don't need to worry about that. This is the normal homeostasis, what happens in the body all the time. If you have low calcium, your parathyroid hormones start working extra time. It makes the calcium to come out of the bone. It causes the kidney to reabsorb more calcium. It increases the vitamin D and that ultimately increases the uh, calcium absorption and calcium gets up higher. These are the conditions which causes low calcium level. And this we talked about, these people have perioral paresthesias, they have carbopedal spasm, they can develop tetany, they can have seizure, these signs we talked about. And the way to treat that is, having a calcium gluconate ampule in the office is pretty good, isn't it? If they have hypocalcemia, you can treat it. If they have hyperkalemia, you can treat it with the calcium. Okay, and then you wanna give, if it's a chronic problem, you give them calcium and vitamin D. And this is when the calcium goes way high. It's the causes are reverse of what we talked about, low calcium. These patients can have polyuria, high blood pressure, anorexia, vomiting, constipation. Sometimes very depressed people who are not responding to the antidepressant, you may want to check their calcium level. Okay, they may be hypercalcemic, which is making them depressed. In those patients, you give them IV saline. These are all the things which needs to be done in the hospital. So if you have a hypercalcemic patient greater than 11, 11 and a half, you wanna probably admit them to the hospital. I'm gonna stop over here and we're right on time. Thank you very much for your attention.